for these few minutes so you can ask your questions at the end. And I'll let you take over. Please Thank give you. a round of applause. Cheers. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming this morning. I appreciate you probably had a long week and also with the snow this morning. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take you through, well, I'll give you, um, this is a bit of an overview of the things I'm going to talk about. So I'll tell you um, a bit about me, um, my graphic design journey, for want of a better term, um, some tips and advice um, that I've sort of learned along the way, um, an opportunity for questions, and then, if there's time and if you have the inclination, um, a sort of short creative workshop or just an activity that um, you can do in your own time that's quite a nice little um, back to basics sort of um, series of exercises. Um, so, about me, um, yep, yeah, as Lauren said, I'm Deputy Head of Design at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Um, so, as part of that, um, I sit in a team of nine people, so I deputise for the Head of Creative Services. Um, we have four designers in the team, one of which is digital, so I line manage them and I also work as a designer myself. Um, we also have um, a production controller who takes care of all the sort of print and things like that, and a studio manager, which is one of the greatest things you can ever have in your team, which is the person that manages um, the workflow through, um, through the studio, um, showing the work out, making sure that um, everything's sort of dis distributed and pushing back to clients where necessary. So, yeah, a wonderful member of the team to have. Um, and we also have a copy editor as well. Um, I'm also an assistant lecturer in, um, at the University of Kent on the graphic design BA there. Um, so working with first years um, on that course. Um, so I've got 16 years of industry experience um, and I've worked uh, across a range of sectors, so um, museums and galleries, publishing, retail um, and also uh, media agencies. Um, I'm also part of a community of artists in North London, so um, I actually share a studio space in Tottenham. So there's about eight of us in the studio um, and part of that is um, delivering creative workshops, um, undertaking undertaking public art projects, which I'll show you a bit of later. Um, and actually, uh, uh, some of my studio buddies, who are actually called Bud Studio, do head up sort of socials in the area for creatives in North London. So really nice to be part of that sort of outside of work. Um, and then my personal interests and hobbies include lino printing, life drawing and um, learning to le uh, work with textiles at the moment. So I quite like um, flat surfaces. So um, this is my journey or a rough outline of sort of how my career has gone. So it was actually just over 20 years ago that I started my design degree um, at Goldsmiths in London. And that was a sort of broad design degree, so um, multidisciplinary, so it was graphics, it was products, it was services, it was whatever you wanted to make based on the briefs, really. Um, and that was a four-year course, so I graduated in 2006. Um, and in between that, sort of picked up various bits of work that sort of came up where I could, and then got my first full-time role in 2007. Um, so um, in terms of getting that first job, that was really... For me, that was the real start of, of my career. Someone sort of uh, saying yes and wanting me to work for them full time, which made all the difference. Um, and I actually got that role. I actually spoke to um, design recruiters, and they were the, the people that put me forward for that role. So that's definitely something that I would, I'll speak about it at the end as well, but something that I would really recommend as much as uh, you might want to lump recruiters and estate agents and various people like that all in a sort of group that you don't really want to deal with. In terms of um, getting jobs, um, finding the right recruiter can help you so much. Um, so, um, yes, as I've shown with the wobbly line, because these things are never sort of just straightforward, um, uh, had that first role, um, went off to Japan for a year because, you know, you follow a boyfriend and you do something different for a year, and then you realise that Teaching English and being in a different culture is really interesting, and it's 
really valuable, but I actually realised how much I missed being a designer as well. So it was really nice to feel that that was something that I wanted to do and wanted to carry on doing. So, um, yeah, came back and um, got another job and started working again as a designer. Um, and in 2014, I went freelance um, and uh, worked for a whole variety of clients. Um, and then in 2019, I started my role as Deputy Head of Design at Kew Gardens and also um, last year started with my lecturing. So I'm just going to take you through um, some work from previous roles and hopefully use them as sort of um, ways of sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way, really. So um, this was my first permanent job. It was for a publishing company called August Media. Um, and their main um, work was with IKEA and this magazine called IKEA Family Live. Um, and this was um, a really great first job to get. Um, it wasn't easy to get, so it was. I was put forward um, by a recruiter, um, and that was because I'd done some bits of little bits of freelance work prior to that. So I had a had a portfolio to to take, um, but I also had to do a test, which I had to do in the studio with them. Um, and this is quite common with design jobs: is that having to take a sort of uh, a design test. Um, sometimes, nowadays, it would be maybe something that you would prepare ahead of an interview, um, but then it's quite a good way of um, uh, giving everyone the same starting point when you're comparing sort of skills and who might be appropriate for the role. So don't worry if you get asked to do a design task, it's sort of part of the process. Um, so thankfully I passed that and they offered me a job and that was um, wonderful. Um, I had a really uh, fantastic creative director at this job. So she was female, um, Jules, and the first thing she did was she took away my mouse on the first day. So that was a bit of a challenge and said, I really think you'll benefit from using a graphics tablet. Um, and I'd never used one before. And she's like, you'll be fine. By the end of the day, you know, it will start, start making sense. So at first I was a bit sort of like this. It was a slow day and I was really sort of, yeah, didn't get much done, but by the end, it, it started to click. And yeah, within a few days, I haven't actually looked back. I still use a tablet every day, and I'm so grateful to her for that. Um, she also gave me a notebook, um, which seems like a really basic thing. But she just said, just write down all of the new things that you're learning and ways of doing things in this notebook. Um, and then you'll just refer back to it, and it'll just make everything quicker and easier. And I've kept that notebook, and I've kept it, I still have it in my drawer at home, um, and it's, it was such a good reference tool um, for myself, um, and I'd recommend everyone sort of keeping one, um, but really kind, <laughs> practical first things from my first sort of manager, really. Um, so this is some of the work, it probably <coughs> might look a little bit old now, um, but this is one of the first double page spreads that I got... Um, got to do for them, which was really exciting, because at first, you know, they start you slowly, so I was doing single page layouts, um, so uh, to get my first spread in this um, magazine uh, felt great. Um, and you're just given raw materials, you're just given copy, you're just given sort of um, images that you might have to cut out yourself, it's very, you know, you really do have to do everything with it. Um, and then turn it into something that, uh, yeah, will get signed off. Um, and then progressing on to sort of longer form um, uh, sort of articles within the magazine. And the other thing about this, um, this job was that the magazine, once it was designed in English, then got translated into 21 different languages. So as much as it was lovely designing and laying this out, I then had to see it multiple times in 21 different languages um, because the translated copy was put directly into the layout so you had to go through and make sure nothing had, had changed. So in terms of working um, neatly and precisely, um, it was really critical for this job. But an absolutely great sort of grounding with um, design principles, designing for print, working closely with editors. Um, 
yeah, and a really nice company to um, work with as well. Um, so uh, another place that I worked um, after that was French Connection, which I'm sure you will have all heard of. Um, and I was actually in the e-commerce team um, when I was at French Connection. So that was working on um, everything to do with their website and in anything digital with them. Um, but it was also for um, another brand that they had called Great Plains. Um, again, that was doing everything digital for them. So um, uh, web pages, emails, landing pages, and actually all the content that went into those. So going on photo shoots, styling models in the studio, um, and then also dial um, designing direct mail, so catalogues that went alongside these things. Um, at French Connection, they actually had um, a whole team of developers um, there as well, so I actually sat next to the developers. So each season for Great Plains and for French Connection, we redesigned um, the sort of layout and functionality of the... Um, of the web pages because we had that sort of luxury really in a similar way to Urban Outfitters how they sort of re-refresh how they have their digital presence just to keep it interesting um, French Connection did the same um, probably not in quite a sort of uh, playful way um, so a lot of the work there was doing emails for, for men's fashion Great Plains uh, the women's uh, collections redesigning those as well um, all of these images that you see of products, we actually also had the um, retouchers um, sat with us as well. Um, so learning about how to cut out pro lots of technical stuff. So like having learning how to cut out products, adding drop shadows, retouching uh, colours. So you might have something a photograph of a top that's only taken in one colour. So how to actually t uh, change that to the correct colour? Um, yeah a whole sort of range of um, work that goes into things that look fairly sort of simple and straightforward, but actually um, quite a lot of time and effort. Um, so some of the other things that we did as part of um, sort of the French Connection website was more sort of interactive features. They wanted people to spend time on the website because the longer you spend on the website, you're more likely to buy something um, or just invest in the brand more. So the sort of dwell time on the um, site was important. So we do things like this. Um, so this was just a really simple feature where we only had limited assets, which were just pictures of shirts. So with this one, you just hover over it and it would pop up and it would give you sort of information um, about the shirts. Or we do more editorial style um, uh, features like this. So a feature on Little Black Dress, that's LBD. Um, and then using model shots, sort of echoing those sorts of layouts and having a sort of basic functionality of when you hovered over um, each of the different models, it would show the different dress and give you some um, details about it. Um, this is interesting because this is sort of predates, obviously, um, how much people are looking at things on their mobiles now. So this really was much more about sort of desktop, like using your desktop. Um, so yeah, maybe of a time. Um, yeah, and then uh, the print catalogues that went along that. So um, for all of these, um, we call it direct mail, but really um, printed in huge numbers um, that would get posted out to people. Um, and crazy things as well. So this um, spring summer collection, um, we went on location to a house um, in South East London for that. Um, thankfully, it was a slightly sunny day, which was good because we were doing this in, I think, January and it was absolutely freezing. So the models were going around having to sort of wear all these light summery clothes, making it seem like they were having a lovely time when actually in between each take and getting changed, they were absolutely frozen. So we sort of like had heaters going and things like that. Um, and this is an example of some of the spreads. So um, this is from another shoot. Um, they always liked quite nice sort of fancy houses that they'd find. So this was one in Salisbury. Um, so I'd be on, on set just to really advise on how I was going to use the images. So knowing that if we're going to use it on a web page, I'd need something that's a landscape shot. 
um, and other shots that might be going in, um, in the catalogue that they would be portraits um, and also having sort of certain clothes that you had to show. Um, and then the same with going into the studio with the stylists and just um, checking that the, the shots, the um, sort of lay flat <laughs> shots and product shots um, were correct. Uh, so I worked, also worked at a place called Links of London, which no longer exists, unfortunately. Um, but this was a jewellery company that had lots of um, stores across the country. Um, and my role there was as a graphic designer, and we did everything again from um, photo shoots, art direction, um, print, and digital. We basically did everything. So um, part of this campaign was going along and meeting the models checking that they seemed all right for the brand, um, and things like product selection, um, retouching. So um, with this particular campaign, um, we were using an advertising agency who provided their photographers and um, sort of executed the shoot. Um, but afterwards, in the post-production, um, sort of I was tasked with overseeing their retouching to make sure that they were sort of... Uh, I say to keep them on track, but you wouldn't believe some of the types of things that they would send back. So you think this is just a this is just a normal image? No, there were about ten shots before this where they'd just tweaked one of the eyes and made a little bit little bit bigger and twisted it and just looked really weird. And I had to go back and say, "Oh, have you done something with the eye? Because that looks a bit strange. And can you take that back?" Or so really crazy little things or. Um, tidying up eyelashes, you know, some of these things go right down to really minute details. Um, and then the main thing with this shot, more than anything, is showing off the jewellery itself. So these bracelets and the charms, which are sort of bestsellers um, for uh, the company. Um, and then a, as part of this campaign, it was rolling it out so that um, it went in the stores, it went into... Um, uh, national magazines as well, so um, things like um, Vogue, so full page ads for those. Um, and a fun fact, if you ever have to do photo shoots of watches, that you have the time saying 10 past 10 because it looks the nicest on a watch. All these little silly things that you pick up when you do these sorts of uh, these projects. Um, and then also to support these model imagery, uh, these model shots, you'd also do um, product shots as well. Um, so again, working with the same agency uh, to really style these shots. So we have this um, Christmas offer. So this is an underground advert on the right, um, obviously advertising our special offer. And this was the supporting product imagery on the left. So... Um, I'm trying to remember how long it took to shoot. I mean, it's, it seems crazy when you see a single image, but the amount of time it took to, sh to shoot that one thing and comp it together and not have to... Jewellery is a nightmare because it reflects. So if you've got a shiny surface and you're trying to take a picture of it, it's going to show you in there. So you've got to either take another picture uh, that's sort of without that or you've got to um, retouch it. There's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. Um, this is an interesting one because... Um, the agency that we were working with um, were French and they were based in Paris. So for this one, I had to go over to Paris for a couple of days um, to work with them. And for the most part, they spoke English, but they would slip into French. So that was always an interesting challenge as well. Um, but also took me to some nice lunches, which I never would have, um, sort of a place I never would have known otherwise. Um, yeah, so some other parts of this role, so designing catalogues, um, for the jewellery company for certain collections. Um, so part of this process would be um, planning out what you're going to shoot before you do it um, because actually there's so much to get through and it actually takes a lot more time to get really um, great photography um, than you would think that actually if you planned your shots and, and what you need to include and how you might use it ahead of time. A bit like storyboarding for an animation or something like that. You, can, you storyboard your shoot before you, before you go and do it. Um, so that was something that was, um, um, we had to do for this. Um, one of the other things, quite often with retail, is you're using things called pack shots, which are those shots when, you, um, when you're shopping online and it's just the, the item that you're buying. Um, 
we had to sort of utilize quite a few of those in, in things like this to try and make them a bit more dynamic, a bit more interesting. Um, so a mixture of uh, specific shoots and styling and then also mixed in with pack shots. And then also, again, sort of making sure that those assets that you've created can be used for um, other types of work as well. So some editorial features that went on their website as well, um, highlighting certain products at certain times of year. Um, so this is a project um, from the Imperial War Museum. Um, so... Uh, I don't know if any of you um, have been to any of the branches. So there's, there's London, um, there's Manchester, there's RAF Duxford, and there's also um, HMS Belfast, which is on the Thames in, um, in London. So um, the Imperial War Museum, they refer to themselves as IWM now, um, and it's really more about um, uh, telling the stories of people that have been involved in conflict. Um, so uh, they have all sorts of um, exhibitions and displays. It's not all historic. There's a lot of contemporary um, stories that they're trying to tell. Um, and they often have fantastic um, exhibitions and really go to town on the whole execution. Um, so when I was working there, we did a Horrible Histories exhibition. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the TV show or there was a film. There's also, they were all sort of, based on the book. So this was based on one called Spies, which was set in um, uh, the Second World War, and it was basically translating the Horrible History Spies book into an interactive family exhibition. Um, so it's a really bad picture on the left, but um, part of it was things like this was um, an activity called Splat the Rats, so there was projections of rats running around on the floor and you'd go and stamp on them. So my role was actually to um, take the rats that we were given, but all the illustrations we were given were actually really small, so actually making them um, viable to be produced at um, a larger size um, and giving them to the um, developers to actually make this game. And then they were, going on to, they were projected onto a floor that was made up of this, this lino. Um, so it's completely... Um, patterned floor that was then going in the exhibition as well. Um, all of the walls were covered in bespoke wallpaper that we um, also had to adapt from the illustrations in the book. And everything that we did with this was in conjunction with the publisher. So because of um, the rights of the imagery, um, we had to make sure that we weren't doing anything that they sort of didn't agree with. Um, but actually, with things like that, um, they were a really nice um, team to work with. And actually, when you apply a common sense approach, you're not going to go and completely turn it into something else. I, I had absolutely no... I, ha I don't think I had any pushback on anything that I'd done. They were sort of happy with that I'd sort of respected the illustrations. Um, so this is just to give you a, a flavour of what goes on, on a, in an exhibition build. It really was like just raw walls and planks of wood and nails everywhere and lots of noise and lots of dust and we had to wear hard hats and steel toe cap boots when you go on site just to check where everything was going um, and the piece on the right was that was about this high um, and that was adapting some of these different rat there's rat characters throughout the book um, uh, this was then adapting it into a game where you could spin the heads the middle of the bodies and and the sort of feet to make different characters. Um, and this is part of the finished exhibition. So those tubes that you saw before then became um, fantastic sort of tree trunks. Um, and uh, so part of the other thing that my role was, so all of these graphic panels on the right, which we call um, interpretation panels, um, it was... Um, designing those, artworking them to make them print at the right size, making sure the text is legible. Um, also setting up this um, artwork above it as well. So these um, uh, sort of routed out letters and the eyes above. Um, and all of the graphics that are dotted around the exhibition, um, they're all, they all came through the design studio. 
Um, so I actually worked with a 3D designer um, who took care of actually the, um, the sort of floor plan of, every, of where everything went and how the actual artefacts would get installed into the exhibition as well. Um, so there are lots of original pieces of, from the museum that were in cabinets, but they were all sort of embedded and built into this, um, into this world. And these are one of the other sort of sections. So um, these little graphics down here within the cabinet, that's also something um, that I did or had to do, and the same with the interpretation panels. Also sort of new graphics sort of based purely on the content of the book in terms of text, then lifting out appropriate illustrations and styling and creating my own sort of um, assets that felt like they were part of that whole um, suite as well. So this was a sort of timeline when you first came in. Um, so this uh, was an, a lenticular wall. So a lenticular is a bit like a hologram. And it's, um, so basically, as you, you, you get postcards with them on um, as well, but as you move it, it creates a motion. But this lenticular, I mean, this is probably actually the size that this actually was. When you entered the exhibition, it was a lenticular corridor. So this was on both sides. And the idea was that as you walked into the exhibition, there was, um, there was movement within the characters. Um, so I have a short, terrible video to give you... Um, let's just hope that this works, to give you a little bit of an idea of how... Uh, sorry, I don't know why it won't... Right. But basically, the eyes move as you walk along, and the shadows carry along as well, and his eyes move, and the rat shadows move along. So sorry about the orientation. Um, but as you can see, it's sort of a full, a full corridor there. And this was really challenging because the producers of um, these, uh, each panel was about a metre square. The challenge was, the producers sort of said, there's, no, there's actually no rule about how to make a successful lenticular. It's like we've seen ones that have worked, ones that haven't. I was like, right, okay. That's, that's not that helpful. And he was just like, really, you just want some key bits of movement in it and don't have everything moving because if everything's moving, nothing really stands out. So that's why I sort of focused on the eyes just following you and the shadows of the rats in between. Um, and I made a series of just stop frame animations um, before I sent any artwork to print just to test the principle of it. And it was doing something that I wanted it to and sent that to the supplier um, and we also got a test panel sent um, just to see that that would work. And that was a really nerve-wracking moment because just a test panel was incredibly expensive. So it got sort of delivered on a Friday, really hoped as I unwrapped it and did a little test down the hallway that it, that it would work, and, and it did. So that was a big relief. But I think because of the planning and the sort of animations that I've made beforehand, it made sure that that, that went fine. So, yeah, really pleased with how that went. Um, and then also part of this, it was um, doing the shop, doing the banners that went outside as well, so um, designing those, artworking those. Um, we also had to print, I can't remember how many, but it was hundreds of these rats because, because it's a child's uh, a sort of a family exhibition. The, the tails on the rats were very easy to snap off and we usually had sort of a couple every day to go, to go out and replace um, so press invites as well, so the print side that went alongside um, the exhibition as well. Um, yeah, and so Royal Botanic Gardens Q, that's um, where I work now. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you have been, but it's in southwest London. Um, this is probably the most sort of iconic um, part of the garden, which is the Palm House. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, and it's been there for over 260 years. Um, uh, one of the key things um, about Kew, aside from its lovely um, 
gardens is that there's a lot of scientific research that goes on there. So we've got lots of um, labs and scientists, and we've got a place called the herbarium, which stores lots of dried plants um, that are all used for um, uh, sort of documenting um, all these different species, but also the research. There's a lot of um, uh, work that they do around um, food security, so researching different types of food crops that can withstand the sort of changing climate, so in the future, what foods are we going to be eating? Um, also, a lot of medical research around... Um, I was speaking to a sort of student scientist who was doing a lot of work using... I think it was time, um, and looking at the properties of that and how it might be um, useful in cancer treatments. So there's actually a lot of... Um, work beyond the sort of face of it with Q that goes on and in, in my role we do obviously work to do with um, the visitor experience but we also do work um, with science and reports um, and sort of things that are sort of less um, sort of public facing as well. Um, so I was just going to uh, show you quickly um, the process of one of the projects um, that we did a couple of years ago which was a summer sort of exhibition um, which was uh, a series of um, installations around the gardens based on different English habitats um, that we often don't really sort of um, think about or appreciate or value for actually the biodiversity that they bring um, and also the elements of well-being that comes from that. Um, and these structures were going to be um, very large, built up um, above ground so that you could actually come and put your head up in amongst it, and you were um, much closer in viewing your, uh, the plants from a different perspective. So it's called The Secret World of Plants, and the concept that got selected, we sort of presented about, I think, 15 different concepts as a team. Um, and the one that we got selected was one that I'd sort of proposed as an illustrative um, execution, uh, a bit of an Alice in Wonderland style sort of... Um, figure in amongst um, all these plants because of the installations and the nature of that. Um, so the first stage with that was to, these are just some sketches of the actual plants that needed to be shown in the creative, just pencil sketches, um, which I then um, digitised, so I just traced over the key ones and elements of those. Um, for this project I actually used Procreate and then brought that into Illustrator um, and uh, live trace those so that they were vectors that I could scale up and also because I knew we were going to be doing animated versions for our digital marketing um, that it could all be layered and have that flexibility for movement. Um, one of the next stages as well was actually to look at colour palettes so um, getting the actual plants that we're going to be seeing in this creative and um, doing some colour picking from those, using those as a basis as well, because actually the natural colours of all of these were quite, um, quite gentle, and we needed something that was a bit, bit more punchy, but they were good. It was a good um, sort of starting point. And then, yeah, so this was um, one of the sort of working layouts that I'd done based on those illustrations, um, and then testing these different colourways, really, um, and sort of pushing it as well. So we also have an after-hours series of programming that would go alongside this exhibition. Um, so uh, I knew that actually if some of these colour sort of color combinations wouldn't work for the daytime, that maybe for the after-hours and evening, those tones might work. Um, and I, was quite, I, I quite liked the idea personally of being a bit more... Um, uh, sort of playful with the colours, so maybe the one on the right, something a bit more um, unusual, um, but as is inevitable with these things sometimes, they wanted a bit a more realistic sort of representation of plants. So this is, um, this is the final sort of master graphic um, that then got used for the campaign. So um, part of the brief was obviously showing the plants that you're going to see, um, uh, a sort of a range of visitors uh, interacting um, with, uh, with the offer as well, and also um, the uh, installation. So we had this curved seat, this curved bench, um, these listening domes which were hung in trees that you could go and sta stand under, and it was only once you're underneath them that you could hear the music. 
and then the figures on the left sort of popping up to represent that um, experience of having your head up in amongst these installations. So um, with this, it was drawn in Illustrator, and I had my master file, and I added um, the textures uh, as some layers in Photoshop as well, just because I felt like that gave it a sort of, uh, a, sort of a, a better sort of feel for what I wanted, and I could be a bit sort of looser with being able to brush in bits of texture where, where I wanted it. So then this is how um, it translated once you then had to put that creative into the various assets. So um, portrait posters that um, get used um, on site, but also what we call out of home advertising. So um, tube posters, um, railway posters, um, press, so magazines and things like that. Um, slightly ropey roadside poster, but, um, but just to give you an idea of um, what it looks like when it's actually sort of out in the world. Um, buses as well. It's one of my favourite things to see some of our advertising on, and this one was particularly um, uh, pleasing because I felt like the, the red in the creative um, worked really well with the red of the bus, so that was just quite a nice sort of... Um, just nice to see out and about. Um, it also got used on the BBC London Evening News, which was quite a surprise. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but they, uh, they'd come to the gardens to do a bit of a feature on, on the sort of exhibition. So they asked us for the graphic and put that in the background, which was a very nice surprise. Um, and then adapting, so more interpretation panels. Um, uh, in the gardens themselves. So adapting and extracting elements of those illustrations into the panels that have the information alongside the various installations and pieces that were going along, um, along with the exhibition. Um, and then are just a few more uh, pieces here. So this is actually just personal work outside of work. So this was through my... Uh, uh, the people that I uh, share a studio with in Tottenham who do a lot of public artwork. And um, this was uh, a project for this pretty uh, nasty um, alleyway uh, in Haringey that um, they wanted to make seem a bit more friendly, a bit more approachable. They were having a new youth centre put, um, put down there as well. So they just wanted the whole approach to be a lot more welcoming. Um, so some of the other projects they do is there's lots of um, murals in the area on the shutters of shops and things like that. But this was actually to sort of dress the light, the lamp posts. Um, so I sort of thought that obviously the first thing that came to mind for me really was making them a bit more organic um, and feeling a bit more like plants or living things. Um, so I uh, proposed sort of hanging sort of plants and things like that from them um, without obstructing the light or functionality um, of the lampposts. Um, so this just gives you an idea of, um, it's just more to do with like the technical side of things really, so a project like that. So as much as I had loose sketches at the start, um, in the end it was providing scale drawings, um, uh, vector graphics, colour references for spray paints, um, and, and basically how to assemble the whole, the whole thing. So um, that's part of it as well, is just making sure that the people that you're working with and the suppliers that you're working with, that you provide them with everything as clearly and as accurately um, as possible. Um, just makes everyone's life easier. Um, and they just recently got installed, so these, these are those lampposts. Um, felt like they might never get installed, so it's actually nice to see them see them there um, and hopefully they'll withstand uh, sort of all the weather at the moment um, and then just a short bit on illustration really um, illustration is something that I just like to do in my own time I really enjoy drawing I enjoy learning other skills um, I like using obviously just a sketchbook but I also enjoy using procreate that was a real the day that an iPad could have the pen that worked in conjunction with it was just fantastic. So 
Um, I really love sort of playing around um, with that. Um, and not only does it, obviously it is something that I enjoy anyway, but it feeds into the work that I do as well. And it's actually really enhanced the type of projects that I've had and the type of work that I do both in my day job at the Cube, but also outside and other creative projects. Um, so these are some spotter guides that, because they'd actually seen some of the illustrations I'd, I'd sort of been doing anyway, um, I was asked to illustrate these spotter guides for work, which was, again, a really nice change of pace to maybe some of the more hardcore uh, graphic design or artworking. So again, actually bringing, bringing something that I enjoy into it had actually led to me being able to do it as part of my day job as well. So that's been a really nice sort of steer in development. Um, and these are some other illustrations for a company that um, look after plants um, uh, in offices and, public, and um, sort of uh, shared spaces. They also come and sort of, if you're going on holiday for a long time, they'll come and look after your plants. Um, but they were doing a series of um, blog posts about um, plants and pets. So I asked if I would do some illustrations around that. So um, that's what those were for. Again, these, so these were um, started off as just pencil sketches, but then um, brought that into, this, these are Procreate um, drawings. Um, yeah, and worked them up in there and making sure that they were set up because these have actually been printed as a series of postcards now as well. So they were digital to begin with, but I made sure that the spec was set up so that they could also be printed as well. Um, and finally, just a little example of some lino printing. Um, so something that I just enjoy but feel that my illustration and graphic design sort of feeds into, I quite like being making quite sort of chunky, bold prints, um, and there's definitely sort of principles from, from design that I bring into that. So, um, my tips and advice um, that I would give you really, um, speak to recruiters. Um, quite often, find the recruiters in your area, um, sort of operating in Nottingham or, or otherwise, so, um, see who there is um, about and speak to them. Show them your portfolio, ask for their advice. They quite often do events um, where they might do portfolio reviews. So yeah, absolutely contact them. I've, I've got several jobs through recruiters and when I was freelancing, they were actually really great and just getting me regular bookings in all sorts of places that I would never have uh, come across on my own. So I, they've been really invaluable. And the other thing to remember is um, not all recruiters will suit you. Um, for, for getting in touch with 20 or whatever, I think there were two that I really had a connection with, and they were the two that just got me all my jobs. But once I'd found them, they were the ones, and it, and it was great. And once you've secured one job through them, you sort of build that rapport, and you get that repeat work, and or they'll put you forward for other things. So really do sort of reach out. Um, and just see who's around. Um, and you can find out who they are through jobs boards as well, so you can see um, uh, it's not always that uh, employers are directly um, uh, recruiting, it'll be through recruiters as well. Um, get someone to proofread your cover letters. So I've been, I've interviewed um, several uh, design, for several design roles and also for um, other roles uh, within the organisation. And um, it's just such a shame if there's mistakes or errors. It's just a sort of professional practice. So just get someone else to just sense check what you've written and just check for any sort of issues. Um, hopefully there aren't any in this. I didn't get anyone to proofread it, but I should have done. So do, do highlight them if you see any errors. Um, Tailor your portfolio. So um, particularly when I was freelancing, I had a master portfolio that sort of had all sorts of projects in it. Um, but when it came to actually applying for jobs, I could just pick and choose the projects that I felt were really um, key for that job that I was applying for and appropriate. Um, so I definitely recommend that because 
if you're applying for a um, magazine job, uh, sort of a magazine design job, sending them a load of sort of animated GIFs is probably not going to be what they want to see because it's not really appealing to what they're asking for. That's, and also, um, recruiters will recommend that um, you don't rely on just having um, a website or just like an Instagram account to show your work. Have a PDF because then they can just send it out to people because actually, again, it's, it's like tailoring your portfolio. It's a bit lazy just sending someone to your website and expecting them to go through it and find what they want to find. You want to make it easy for them. You want to show them that you uh, are listening to them and just give them what they're asking for. Um, as I mentioned earlier, keep a notebook of things you learn and techniques and training notes. Um, it's, it's just a, a reference for yourself that is just really so helpful to go back to, and I still do it myself. I'm always learning. Um, and learn keyboard shortcuts. Actually, that was the other thing that my creative director in my first job told me. It saves so much time. Once you get more advanced with using your programs, it is just... Um, yeah, so quick. It just speeds up your whole efficiency of your practice. Um, uh, yeah, and then because the quicker, you know, the less time you're spending on going up to menus and things like that, the more you can get on with the actual more creative thinking and part of your job. Um, I'd also recommend have interests. It doesn't matter what they are, but just having something else going on not only is really nice as a break from working doing your job, um, it can feed into it as well. Or it might be that that's an area that you move into. Um, you know, if you're really in, if you play a lot of football, um, not that I play a lot of football, but I had a booking um, for EFL and was doing banners for them that were um, going out based on results that were happening that week. Um, so actually, you can move into an arena of work within graphic design um, to do with something that you really feel passionate about or really enjoy. Um, so don't feel that your interests have to be design-based, but you can really, you can pull the two together, and that's really nice. Um, ask questions. Ask questions of your peers. Ask questions of your, um, well, certainly whilst you're studying as well. Get as much out of this as you can, because, um, you know, once you're out in the working world, there are people you can ask, but, um, and obviously, hopefully you'll be in an environment where people, your manager is good and, and things like that. But just try and get as much informa information from the people that um, you feel confident and safe with whilst you can. Um, do your research. Research companies that might interest you. Um, how would you get a job there? You know, what type of work do they do? Can you do some personal projects that might appeal to them so that when they do have a job or they've just got an sort of they say that they're just open to applications anytime anyway because they just want to always sort of um, see what people are up to? Um, if you've uh, engaged with that and what they're doing, then they're more likely to sort of um, notice you. Um, network. I mean, I hate that term, but um, it's more just speak to people, you know, meet people. It, it makes such a difference, and it's actually something that I really only, I would say, it's only in the last few years that I've actually really felt the benefit of, because I've actually really shied away from that sort of stuff. I've not really gone to networking events and things like that so much, but just actually networking can be online. You know, you can meet people um, Oh, I've actually had it recently. I've met someone who I've sort of been sort of like Instagram friends with um, for quite a long time. And we finally met in person. And um, I feel like that's a whole like other network of people and activity um, that's just come out of that. So networking doesn't have to be sort of cringy, it, but it, make it work for you in terms of what you feel comfortable with. Um, yeah, say yes to things, get involved. Certainly early on, I said yes to um, picking up little pieces of not great paid work, but it meant that I got a bit of a portfolio, which meant I could get my, my first job. Um, 
if you don't look, if you uh, don't know something in terms of technical things, just look it up. It didn't really exist when I started. I couldn't just really look things up. It's so much better now. I still Google things all the time when I don't know how to do it. There's so many and tutorials out there. It's just, yeah, the resources that are available to you now are just fantastic. So look it up, do tutorials. Also, tutorials are really great for that thing that you just want to do one time. I had to do some water effect on something recently. It's like, I don't know how to make this water effect with this certain amount of ripples, but I just followed a tutorial and I did it and it was fine. I don't really need to retain that but the information was there. And yeah, the learning never stops. I'm still learning um, and I enjoy it. It's part of the job. I really um, appreciate uh, the fact that I am still learning. Um, and resources. Um, Creative Lives in Progress is, um, I follow them on Instagram, but they've obviously got a website as well and they do I think that's the most um, up-to-date and sort of relevant um, place for, um, yeah, just really sort of on-the-nose on information about what's going on, and, protect, and particularly for um, young and emerging creatives. So I really recommend sort of following them and just seeing the type of stuff they have. So they have really interesting interviews, um, sort of uh, blog pieces... Um, and also sort of highlighting events and portfolio reviews when studios are actually holding um, portfolio reviews as well. So really good. Um, you probably all know these already. Um, it's nice that, and if you could, jobs. Good for reading articles. And the job section actually is a really good research tool because even if you're not looking at a, for a job, looking at what jobs are out there and who's hiring and what they're asking for in their job specs is actually a really good way of gauging maybe areas that you might need to, um, or little gaps that you might want to plug or focus on. So it's actually a really good um, research tool as well. Um, design week for articles, just general. Um, and then I quite like um, looking at Pentagram's website. You know, they update it quite regularly. They do really good case studies. Um, it's really um, a useful resource. I would say, um, but do the same with any other agencies that you like the work of. Like, really spend some time looking at the nuts and bolts of, of, of what they do and how they communicate it, because um, I think it really benefits then with how you present yourself when you see how other people um, represent their work. Sorry, I know it was quite long. <laughs> Should we do round of applause? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is great, by the way. I have visited Key, Kew Gardens two years ago. It looks amazing, and the layout is like so very well designed. I went with the kids, so it matters when you go with the kids, because whatever. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Anyway, um, in our industry, we are so much, sometimes so much pushed to choosing one direction. It feels like you've touched on so many things. You started with editorial design, then you moved to UI, UX somehow, then you went a bit back, then you did a bit of, I don't know, photo shoot. I don't know exactly how that's even called in the industry. Sort of art direction, I exactly. suppose. Exactly. Mm. And then... Um, now you're doing Q Gardens. How, what do you think about this master of none, trader of all, whatever, <laughs> what's the thing he saying says, and what would you advise us to do? Um, well, I think you can, I, you can see from the scope of work I've done, I wouldn't necessarily describe myself as having a particular style, like a personal style, and I'm sure some of um, the other people that you've had speaking really have a very strong aesthetic, and they're quite, like, singular in, in what they do um, but a lot of my roles have been in-house which rather than um, studio based um, which means that um, 
I've worked within those brands and the guidelines that they give. And normally, within those roles, they're quite... Once you're in, they're quite broad. So you do put your hand to these different... Um, all these different tasks. Um, so particularly... Um, when I was working in like retail, you know, that involves the e-commerce side of it, but it's also included the print side of it. Um, so those types of roles just allowed me to, it had all those different facets within it. Um, and, that's, and that's how I just got that experience. But really it sort of happened, I just, with each job I built, it was just incremental. So that first job was print, um, but that led on to me getting the next job, which had print and a bit of digital which then led on to having something that was very digital based so I did have to learn on I really had to learn as I went but again I had to do a digital test which was enough to get my foot in the door and then I learned once I was in so with a lot of this I think if you're willing to learn and you can get your foot in the door you just need to show enough of a skill that enables you to to start then once you're sort of in those environments, you learn, you learn so much. But in terms of having that broad remit, um, I think it, it really depends on your sort of um, what you enjoy doing, really. Like, don't force yourself to do something if you, if you hate it, if you're just like, I don't want to animate anything. I really just want to do static graphics or vice versa, you know. Don't, don't force it, because there are so many different types of job and what I would say is, yeah, just look around at the types of jobs that are out there and what, they're, what requirements they're asking for um, and see what types of ones you feel like you might be fitting with or aligning with. Um, and, then, and then start sort of, once you've recognised that, then seeing... So for me personally now, the type of roles I do, um, things like museums and galleries and the charity sector are definitely sort of an area for me that I... Um, feel that I fit into, I connect with, um, I can really get on board with the purpose of the work. Um, and, and for me, that's how I've sort of... That's what's led me as well. I think you have to be, enjoy, like, make a connection with the work as well, um, depending... But, you know, retail is something that... It, it's been part of the part of the journey you know it's not been the end point but through it I've learned the skills that have enabled me to get on to the next thing so that's the other thing it's quite a fluid I would say particularly as a as a designer it's been quite fluid for me you know I've not felt that I've had to stay anywhere for ages you know once you're somewhere it doesn't mean that you're going to be there forever that's the other thing it's not it doesn't have to be it can be if you love it but actually you know you might be somewhere for a while feel that you've reached the limit of what it offers you and then you move on to something else that provides some more, um, you know, experiences and challenges. And that, that is the beauty as well of um, working as a designer as well. It, it does feel quite fluid and can adapt and open up. Thank you. And would you say that that was, um, those skills were easy, transferable skills from one to the other? Were they, there, there was like a connection leading towards the next step? I think, I, I feel like there was. Yeah, it, it felt like a natural progression. And also, I mean, a lot of the well, a lot of the skills that you, you're learning are quite universal, you know. They're principles that apply from um, you know, print to digital to even art direction, you know, obviously I'd never <laughs> again, like you're, this is all very visual and you start um, just doing things um, naturally your eye for composition is just growing with each thing that you're doing so you will start understanding um, you won't always be thinking uh, for a pitch you might you know, at first you might be like, oh, well, I'm going to think, you know, in thirds and, you know, I should put this thing over this side because that means that it's balanced and things like that. It just starts happening naturally in a natural development. And it's the same with your technical skills. Um, I think it all, fe it all feeds in. It's all connected. Yeah. Have we got any more questions? 
It was really nice to see a female graphic designer, uh, first of all. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I've got a few questions. My first one was, um, do you feel like having a female creative director in the beginning and having more of a supportive managerial role really helped you to feel like you could develop as a graphic designer when you first started out? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I'd, I'd never really thought about it, but absolutely. Um, the further I've gone in my career, the more I've um, appreciated that that first chance and that um, sort of confidence. Like she was really, she was so supportive of me. I mean, she was supportive of everyone. I don't, you know, it wasn't just me particularly, but at that stage as a junior and a first proper job, she was really aware of the things that were really helpful for me to 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 get going. And I think, yeah, I do think it was really valuable. And my second question is, like, now you've gone on to so many different things, what I've really liked is, like, your journey as a graphic designer. It's kind of mixed with corporate as well as style. Um, but how did you navigate um, being in environments maybe that you didn't always feel like you had the skills, but you'd go for the design test, you got through? How would you navigate maybe, mm, not like imposter syndrome, but just that thought of, like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing right now, but I've got the vision. How, how did you navigate that? Um, so... So when I was at French Connection, um, when I first started, I had a manager who didn't really show me anything or tell me anything, just expected things to be done. And that was quite a scary prospect. And um, one of the things was, to, like a technical thing was, um, uh, cutting out garments, giving them the right shadow, recoloring and things like that. And I was just like, oh my God, I have like, I think I sort of know. Um, but I think it's finding um, allies. So the retoucher who worked in the team was lovely. And I just went to him after, at the end of the day one day and I said, look, I'm being asked to do this, but I don't know, I don't know how to do it. And he took, it, he took me through it and he gave me the file that we worked on and um, we went through it together again and I just kept that. And once he'd shown me, I felt confident that I could then implement that. So... I think um, find people that you feel comfortable asking things um, so that you don't feel like that. Because there's nothing worse. You don't want to feel like that. And you, you should never feel like that because you are, you'll be in a place for a reason. They will have put you there for a reason. Um, and just do what you need to do to, to feel confident about that. Um, and it, that manager was really unhelpful so when I manage my team, I always think I want to be the opposite of that. Like, no question is too small um, or silly, and, it, and it's fine to ask, because once you ask, then it's just easier. Um, but yeah, find people to, that you feel comfortable with that you can ask. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, and when in regards to like recruiting, um, did you feel, when you approached them, did you send them your portfolio, or was it just more of like a question-based, like, I'm a freelancer, I'm looking to do X, Y, Z, was it that kind of conversation, or did you just kind of research different recruiters that worked in the design field and then kind of go from there? Yeah, so um, recruiters that specialise um, sort of in design and creative um, uh, sort of services. Um, and then, yeah, usually it would be sometimes they have a particular address that actually is specifically for um, uh, sort of new, new people that they want to get on, the, on their books. Um, and so it would be sending across, yeah, an introduction, your CV, a portfolio, um, and then following up with them as well, seeing if you can get a call with them just to discuss it. I mean, I say sort of speak to quite a few because there will be some that you just don't hear from and that can be fr frustrating, but it's nothing personal. It's just because that's how they operate. But that's why the ones that you do connect with are really good to sort of stick to and stick with because then you can build a relationship um but yeah just just follow up that's the other thing with lots of things just follow up call up um yeah sort of gently harass you know <laughs> thank you so much thanks jay did you have a question hi hi um my question is, like, do you know when you go into the interview, what do you think is the most important things to take with you, both physically, like, mentally as well? What do you think is important to have during the interview process? So, I'm just trying to think, because we, we just um, went through the, sort of, an interview 
for a designer role in, in our team recently, actually. And the candidates that I felt really um, that impressed the most were the ones that answered the questions that we asked them. I know that sounds strange, but like some of them just completely didn't sort of answer with something else. Um, I think just uh, make sure you've got questions to ask as well, to make sure it's the right fit for you. Because, um, you know, there, as an interviewer, you're um, wanting to learn about the person that's applying for a job. But, you know, as interviewee, you want to make sure that it's the right job for you. So, you know, really try and be aware of the, how it makes you feel when you're in, in that interview process. You know, like, do I like these people? Do I feel comfortable? Does the, does the sort of job sound like something I want to do? And ask questions about the job if they haven't told you. I think that's the other thing. Make sure you've got things to ask them because um, depending on whether there's a second interview or not, that might be your only opportunity. Um, in terms of uh, presenting things, it, it really depends. I've had interviews where someone's brought a lot of print work, actual physical print work um, with them, and that's fine. Um, I think it's just making sure that it's... <laughs> Not too long. I know I sort of showed a lot of things. Um, but yeah, sort of tailored again to, to the job that you're, you're applying for. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have any more questions that people want to be asking? This side of the room, you've been quite quiet. Any questions from you guys? Oh. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hi. So you showed us the exhibition that you created. Um, my question would be, what advice would you have to ensure that when we create an exhibition, it goes smoothly and also ensure that we don't go like over budget? Yeah, well, for an exhibition, always have contingency because it will always sort of financial contingency, time contingency if you can, because things inevitably take a bit longer. There'll always sort of be hiccups um, along the way. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, just planning, really. I think as much scoping um, and uh, planning ahead of actually sort of um, executing will help. Is it something that you've got coming up? Are you going to be putting on an exhibition? Or? No, I'm considering when I go back to it. Yeah, I think um, also speak to your suppliers that you're going to be working with and get timeframes from them. Ask them what they're like the common things that come up that might delay issues. Um, and, I mean, we've actually had a project that's been sort of delayed by a couple of years because the cost of materials has gone up. So one of the other things as well with exhibitions is um, if you've got the time and there's certain materials that you need, if you can secure the pricing on materials and things like that ahead of time, that's also something to consider. Um, uh, but, yeah, if it's... Also, if you've got multiple people involved, just making sure that you've got a schedule and a schedule that people stick to, um, that will just, that's the ideal for trying to make things go as smoothly as possible. <coughs> Last question, anyone want to take it or should we close up? Oh, oh Gabby, thank you. <laughs> Hi again. So my question is um, somehow based on the weather today. Um, have you ever considered sustainability? Uh, is, when it comes to your work, is where you get the materials or, I don't know, the, whatever, I saw that you're using a lot of materials. So obviously I, I don't want to say just the paints or whatever because it involves a lot of stuff. Yeah. But is that an, a thing you consider uh, when you are working on your projects? Um, so in terms of, exhibitions and things like that um the the procurement of of things like that is um through another team the sort of visitor programming team but when we look at um but it is it is a consideration for them and a lot of what we do it, it's thinking about what can be done with it afterwards um things that can be repurposed and not um, recycled so a lot of the plants that might be brought in and grown for certain exhibitions then get sent out to community projects and, and, and places like that. Um, but actually, we're doing a big piece at work at the moment to do with print. So obviously, um, the paper that we use, um, how it's, like, what happens to it afterwards, 
how much needs to be printed, are there alternatives, um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely sort of something that's sort of um, on, on our agenda. And also in terms of sort of energy, um, the suppliers, like how far away the suppliers are, so actually having suppliers that are a lot more local to us as well. Um, so it's viewing it not just in materials, but also in the whole the whole process of how things get from one place to another and how they're originally sourced. So, yeah, it's definitely sort of part of the... And it's becoming more, more of the conversation as well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm just look, checking the time. And if we <laughs> close up the session now, you'll have a break between now and the session in Confetti X at 12. So I'm just aware I don't want you to be sitting in dark rooms all day. Go outside and enjoy the wonderful weather. So um, we've got a half hour break. And then if you can head over to Confetti X for 10 to, we'll see you in there. Thank you, May. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.